The airline operators of Nigeria, AON, have suspended plans to shut down its operation from Monday night, 2022, pending the outcome of engagement with government. The association's statement announcing the suspension was signed by its president, Abdelmonati Yunasi Sarina, and six other airline executives. The airline operators had initially issued a statement announcing plans to shut down operations, citing the high cost of aviation fuel. However, no sooner the, operation, the operators announced the decision then cracks began to emerge within their ranks. The operator said they decided to suspend the shutdown to allow for a fresh round of dialogue with government in the hope of reaching an amicable solution. Members of the association said they received numerous calls from the highest echelons in government with promises to urgently intervene in the crisis being faced by the airlines. They also said they took the decision in the interest of numerous customers. Meanwhile, Prices may not have been averted yet in the aviation sector, as three labor unions announced their intention to embark on a two-day warning strike. The strike is to protest the government's failure to fulfill its promise to implement minimum wage consequential adjustment in the aviation sector since 2019. They are also aggrieved by the government's failure to approve uh, the reviewed condition of service in Paracetal since 2013. In a joint statement, the National Union of uh, Air Transport Employee and the Association of Nigerian Aviation Professionals, an amalgamated union of public corporations, said the strike will commence on Monday, May 9. Arras used to understand that the Ministry of Aviation and the National Salaries and Income and Wages Commission are making frantic efforts uh, to call the disputes. The unions further threatened that if nothing concrete comes up after the warning strike, they would declare a total strike. Yesterday, we had Air P CEO Alan Oyema on This Day Live, and also the chairman of United Airlines, uh, Professor Obiara Okonko, who appeared on Newsnight to address the situation and how they have been putting up with the rising cost of jet fuel. The truth is that the airline operators of Nigeria are now on strike. We're not going on strike. Strike is different from what we are doing. We are saying... Sometime in January, we were buying fuel for 200 naira to a litre. And even then, the cost of operation was about 40% in Nigeria. By March, it went up to 300. From 300 to 440. So you have over 100% increase between January and March. Remember, that was the time when we looked at our unit cost. We said, this is not sustainable. So airlines, some airlines went to 50,000 as the minimum fare. Some went beyond 50,000, maybe 55,000. Some went down to, I mean, rose up to 45 from what it used to be as the minimum fare. And there was uproar that airlines ganged up. No, as an operator, you only look at your, the unit cost per seat and decide which of your inventories to implement. That was when fuel was 440 naira to a liter. Now it rose within weeks to 500, 550, then 600. We were at the National Assembly. We met with the National Assembly. We met with NNPC. We met with uh, the Nigerian midstream, downstream um, regulatory authority. We met with all these people. Promises were made. They told us going forward it had to be 500. 500 was even too much. But the 500 never came. We are still buying 580, 500, 550. At the time, it hit 600. Now, within few, just uh, about a week ago, 700. We are on a march towards hitting 1,000, if nothing is done. Now, what do we do? We have no reason to engage in anything near strike. We are not, we don't have any business with strike. And we don't have anything against this government. To the opposite, airline importers of Nigeria has told the world, whoever is things and want to hear, that there would have no innovation industry today without this government. 
because it is this government that granted the airline operators duty free on the partition of aircraft, duty free on the partition of uh, spare parts, free VAT, and so many other things. And that is the reason why we still have aviation industry today. And at every point in time, we cry out. They have listened to our cry and take the necessary step. When we made this last call, the, the, the House of Reps, the leader in the leadership uh, level, had come together and invited us to a meeting, three meetings like uh, Honorable has said. We made the chief of staff to the president. They did 100% no expected to do. They brought all the stakeholders together. Agreements were reached. But the problem is that at that point we made this call, it was waking up and suddenly from December, when we had a vision fell at 200 naira, by March it was getting to 500 naira. And we cried out that at this rate, the biggest loser in this should be the passengers. We don't want to go too high with our prices. And then these agreements were reached that we should come together, agree on certain pricing, and agree on certain procedures of setting aside some quantity of the one for, for the operators. That's what we did. But I tell you today, MNP is not, is not, is not talking to us. Somewhere along the line, they remained 100% in all their agreements. In fact, they denied even agreeing to that. That was very, very disappointing. And we continue to suffer. We continue to bear it. At that point, today, as we speak, let me give you a better example of what's going on. Aviation fuel is now 700 naira per liter. And if you take an average aircraft of 50 passengers, ERJ1, ERJ145, it carries 50 passengers. And to make a one-hour flight, let's say from Lagos to Abuja, it will require the cost, the direct cost of that ticket. Is fifty-five thousand A lot to talk about this morning, Tundo. Yes, I mean the basic crux of the matter is the steep increase in the price of aviation fuel from one hundred and ninety naira per liter to seven hundred naira per liter, and um, the airline operators of Nigeria deciding that they shouldn't pass on those steep costs to the passengers. So far, so altruistic. How? Ever. There have been criticisms of this position that they have taken, as altruistic as it may appear on the face of it. The um, Moman marketing, or all majors marketing of Nigeria, that association, has been highly critical of that position, saying that the aviation fuel um, price increase is not a Nigerian phenomenon. It's affected the whole world. Look at the Russia-Ukraine mm. war and the, the damaging effect that it's had, inflation, foreign exchange um, scarcity, and that other people have not taken that position. So they are faulting the position that the AON has taken and saying that how have they tried to ameliorate the situation? Have they tried to apply for a license to import fuel themselves, as they said that they had done in February? According to them, no, they have not. Have they tried to be more strategic and sort of order in advance? They made a really... Um, uncomplimentary comparison to people driving an Uber, that mm. they just buy fuel as and when they need it, sort of just off the cuff, that it's mm. not strategic, it's not well planned out. So that's a criticism of the business models that some of these airlines are operating. And within the AON themselves, different members started to pull out. We had um, Ibom Air firstly saying that they are not going to you know, take that position, that flights will continue, but they increased the cost of their tickets, which is what AON has claimed that they are trying to avoid for the benefit of the Nigerian public. But you had other airlines pulling out. You had Dana, you had Arik, you had Aero pulling out of this. It wasn't a strike. They're just trying to be kind to the public. That's their position. But so now the AON has had to shelve that for now, because that, that's in their statement. It's not, it, it seems as if it's conditional, this um, suspension of that position that they've taken. And it appears that the House of Reps has, you know, 
dived right into the matter. They've cancelled their emergency plenary session today to discuss all these issues plaguing the aviation industry, including the one you talked about with the mm. different unions who have had an eight-year agreement to increase their wages and allowances and what have you that has been defaulted on, and they're going on strike. So there was a plan to discuss the general situation, which has been suspended, which for me, which has been cancelled, the emergency plenary session by the House of Reps. It's for me, it's a good sign that it's been cancelled because they are saying that they have their nearing um, resolution of the issues with the AON so that, you know, Nigerian passengers can have the full range of choices. I think that's the ultimate outcome here. And so I guess we wait to see what that resolution looks like. But the good news now is that the, that um, downing of tools, not a protest, has been suspended for now. Dr. Abati? Well, the aviation industry in Nigeria was badly impacted by uh, COVID-19. Even before COVID-19, it was a troubled sector of the economy. At the time, there was a call for bailout, and the Nigerian government tried to provide about 4 billion naira to assist the various airlines. But that looked like a drop in the ocean. It didn't make any difference. Now, even as the world is trying to adjust to living with uh, COVID, we've also had this problem of the war in Ukraine, and the global disruptions in terms of demand and supply, and the fact that uh, the cost, yes, the pump price of uh, fuel, you know, has gone up uh, internationally. The cost of crude oil has gone up. Every other thing associated with it has also uh, gone up. And now you still have, have this uh, aviation sector in Nigeria also in a very troubled place. Now, before now, they said that uh, the option they had was to increase uh, you know, airfares. And they did that about a month ago. In fact, as you speak now, for you to buy a, a normal ticket, economy class, that would be about, you know, close to 100,000. For you to buy business class on some of the airlines, you pay up to about 200,000. So the airline operators are saying this is no longer sustainable because, as uh, Alan Oyama, the chairman of APC, said in the interview I had with him, yesterday on this day live, which was what was played out there, he said, look, about 95% of revenue goes into the purchase of uh, jet fuel alone. So if you use 95% uh, of your revenue to buy jet fuel, then of course it means it is not sustainable. However, when they now claim that they will suspend operations, what are their specific prayers? Which was one question that I posed to uh, Mr. Allen Oyama yesterday are the airline operators asking the Nigerian government to provide subsidy? Because aviation fuel is already deregulated. So what specifically are you asking for? Secondly, what are they asking for? Do they want to uh, break the monopoly of NMPC import and its agents, Duke Oil and others, you know, importing everything? Is it that the airline operators themselves want to import directly so that they can manage their costs? and escape from all these details about landing costs and all of that. Yes, they had made an application to that effect, but that had application up to now has not, uh, you know, um, they've not made much progress with it. So it's not enough to just say the federal government has weighed in, the federal government has called a meeting. Now, what will be the outcome of that meeting? This is not the first time that the Nigerian government is meeting with airline operators and offering to help one way or the other. We hope that, you know, look, what they've done today, you know, leading to the suspension yesterday, is not just an attempt to buy time. Because if you look at it critically, what the Nigerian government has done on the two major issues facing the aviation sector at the moment is to use divide and rule tactics. And it is as follows. The airline operators of Nigeria, about 11 of them, they met and they issued that statement about the plan to suspend operations. But by uh, yesterday uh, morning, Ibom Air had already issued another statement and said the only reason their name was featured in that DC is because they are members of the uh, association, not necessarily because uh, they took a decision that they will suspend and that they will continue to provide service. By afternoon, by 4 p.m., Dana Air had also withdrawn. So, and I saw, you know, this looks like uh, a divide and rule uh, tactics orchestrated, you know, by those who wanted to prevent the situation. On the other hand, is the other strike by the amalgamated union or, uh, unions in the uh, aviation sector. People working with AIB, NAMET, NAMA, all the uh, NCAA, all those uh, unions, 
They refused. They said, look, they were going to down tools, two-day warning strike, because nobody has implemented the national minimum wage. Okay? As of this morning, some other unions have come forward to say, no, we are not part of it. Atsan and some other groups they said we are not part of it. So you see an attempt to divide the ranks. We may not have concrete evidence, but that is what it looks like. So even if uh, out, uh, the airline op operators, AON, if they go ahead to have the meeting today in Abuja, how about the unions that are still complaining? But whichever way you look at it, from both sides, the persons that will experience the hardship are the ordinary Nigerian people who cannot travel by road and have peace of mind, who cannot travel by rail without having fears about bomb attacks by terrorists and fears of abduction. And now, if this uh, last minute uh, effort had not been made, uh, by this morning, people will not be able to fly. So I think it's a good thing that the uh, airline operators have said, let us give government the benefit of the doubt. Uh, let us have the meeting with them. But how will this meeting that they have proposed for today be different from previous meetings? And what are the likely outcomes in specific terms that can make air transportation uh, more beneficial, not just to the operators, but also to government, and also to the ordinary people who have been slammed with uh, a transfer of uh, cost, the 95% of revenue that goes into the uh, uh, purchase of aviation fuel. Some people may go, go for that and say, why are we uh, uh, importing uh, uh, aviation fuel? Is it not just kerosene? They just give it a fanciful name and call it JTA1. It's kerosene we're talking about. Okay, but that's another uh, issue entirely. But we just hope that uh, also the airlines will pay attention to the intervention by the Federal Competition and Consumer uh, Protection Council Commission, FCCPC, led by Babatunde Urukera, who is going to join us later this morning. Having issued a statement that these airlines, although they said they were going to suspend operations, were still selling tickets. And the FCCPC has our cause to say, no, if you want to suspend operations, you suspend operations. You don't sell future tickets and collect money for services you are not planning to provide. But I guess the suspension will have taken care of that. But it's important for all parties concerned to pay the necessary attention to details. We know there are global forces affecting everything in this country, but I tell you for free, the airlines are as complicit as the government in all of this. And I keep saying that the airlines should come clean to a lot of Nigerians. Nigerians deserve better. You cannot say because of problems of aviation fuel, you will not handle your own basic operational problems. I've been hearing this, Tundu, but I felt very sad for Nigeria this morning. I was to catch a 6 p.m. flight yesterday. The flight didn't leave until 11.30. I got into Lagos around 12.10. I got to my home around 1.30 a.m. this morning. And it's a major airline in Nigeria. So when you see things like that, and you hear the pains of people, you wonder, can you really make a case for the airline when they talk about aviation fuel? Yes, it's a strong case. But all of this just goes to show the brokenness of the Nigerian system. The passengers, you pass on the costs, then you can't even pass on adequate service. I've barely shut my eyes because I knew if I had slept, I would have snoozed and I would not be on the show this morning. So it behoves on the airlines, too, to do their own part. Because, and it's, I think it's across board now. No airline is immune. All of them, shambolic. Shambolic. And you need to see the temerity. No apology. They didn't even see it as anything. And that's what people face. So I'm happy I experienced it myself. So it's not that we are just speaking about that. You see, when you now talk about the case of aviation fuel, it's an indication of our collective failure as a nation. That at this day and age, we don't have a refinery that can churn out aviation fuel. We still need to import 
I would say we are an oil producing nation and we are depending on the international forces for a product we have right here. So this is Nigeria happening to all of us again. The airline can make a case, but Dr. Abati, let me quickly answer your question you asked. Nothing will happen from this new meeting they are going to do. I'm not a pessimist. You remember this was the same meeting they had with Mele Kiari. Was that a couple of months down the line, two or three months ago? What became of that meeting? Didn't they reach agreement? Are we not back there again? So if they reach agreement in this meeting, it's just going to be kicking the can down the road. Because we have not addressed the problem of aviation fuel, which is a value chain problem. And it will continue to increase. Is it only aviation fuel? What about diesel? And in all of this, Nigerians always get the short end of the stick. It's either the airlines are not treating them properly, or nothing is happening. That's all the news headline. We take a short break. When we return, we'll have Rotus, we have Michael, we have Aaron to give updates on Africa, global business and sporting activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to Morning Show here on Arise News. Our dependable Rotus Sajiri is here to give us an African business update. Good morning, Rotus. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, uh, Rafai. Good, Good morning morning. to all our viewers. Yeah, so I mean, we'll continue the conversation from the uh, aviation soap opera that we saw uh, over the weekend. Doctor, great interview with uh, Alan Oyema of Air Peace. I also saw the News 9 interview with uh, the head chair of uh, United uh, Nigeria Airlines, uh, Chief uh, Obiora Okonkwo. Look, um, there's a lot of emotions in this matter that need to be taken out. Uh, the fact of the matter is when your prices go up, well, sorry, when your cost of doing business goes up, you increase prices. It is really that simple. There is no reason for this to be drawn out as much as it has been drawn out. If you are a, a baker and you bake bread and the cost of flour goes up, you will pass on the prices to consumers. It happens all over the world. It happens everywhere. So for the airline operators of Nigeria to say that they don't want to increase prices because of uh, uh, passengers and so on and so forth, it doesn't, it, it doesn't jive with um, Economics 101 and doing business. We can, we can even tie this into what's going on with the, um, the NCC. Right? And the, the Nigerian Communications Commission rejecting the increase, the request for an increase in SMS and call rates from the, uh, the, from the representatives of Alton, the Association of Licensed Telecom Operators. And that's wrong. You, you, you should not be impeding private sector players who are telling you that their cost of doing business is going up. It's a 40 to 45%, so I'm sorry, 35 to 40% increase. They use diesel to run what you're looking at now, these base stations that are around the country. It costs a lot of money. So if a, if a player in a sector comes together and tells you that I need to raise costs because this is the cost of my business, you have to do it within, I mean, you consider, of course, the consumers, which is what the NTC is saying, that they consider the consumers and also consider the competition. But you do that in a way that you, 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 you look at the marketplace and as a regulator, you do not impede the, um, the uh, operations of these companies. Because now that you've rejected it, what do they do? So again, so, so, so back to, to, to aviation. The, um, and, and doctor, do have to correct something. NNPC doesn't have um, the sole, it's not a monopoly when it comes to importation of all fuels. It's just for petrol because uh, diesel uh, and the rest are, are deregulated. That license that they're looking to get, the aviation sector is looking to get, what difference is it going to make? Even if you get the license, you are importing a deregulated product. It doesn't matter who. The FX component of this is one of the big issues. The fact that you know, the cost of bringing in that imported product into the country, that 500 Naira um, ma um, cap that uh, Chief Obiora Okonkov mentioned on Newsnight, um, it's at, from what I understand, it's the landing cost is now 550 or even more than that. So it doesn't make any economic sense for them to to um, to pay at 500, which is why, they, according to him, they haven't heard from the NNPC. If the NNPC is unable to make contributions to the federation accounts uh, when it comes to PMS because of the high cost of subsidy. How on earth do you expect them to be able to support you in any way, shape, or form with a 500 naira cap on a deregulated item that is um, aviation fuel? How is that supposed? What math? Of course, you're not going to hear That's from them. That's why I say the meeting will fail. It's not. It's, you, look, a it's, not, going, it's not going to work. It's so not going look, to work. this thing is. It is. The, I don't know. Nigeria. We like to act like we are unique in some way of shape or form. Go and look at prices for tickets to fly to any other country around the world. Prices are rising. So when you're, it is. 
you're, you are doing business and you are selling something. If the cost of doing business goes here, you sell it at here. It is, it is, it is, it's that simple. Finally, um, what else is going on? Zimbabwe, they've included, put in uh, capital controls. They announced it over the weekend. Zimbabwe is putting in capital controls in order to try to support uh, their currency. Very interesting. Uh, essentially, third-party um, processing of payments to essentially foreign subsidies, rep repatriation is not going to happen anymore. They're even cutting down on lending. Uh, Mr. President Nanangwana said that uh, lending in Zimbabwe's banking sector leads to a, an increase in broad money supply, which because of there's an increase in money Switch supply now, it, well, it's up inflation one, but it also says it leads to speculation in the currency. So it's going to be interesting to see whether or not the uh, capital controls they put in place will uh, change things. But we all, we all know the playbook about capital control. When you put in capital control, it brings about a restriction. It tightens things up. Mm. So it does. is Zimbabwe ready for that constriction? In its well, economy now, for an economy that is barely churning out anything. Mm. Because we've tried this playbook. Remember the 80s too in Nigeria? Yeah. Price control, capital control, and everything. That's price and, control is what yeah, we're talking about now in you aviation the, and telcos. This is where uh, essential commodity, people are importing milk and the likes, and you have to go and buy from a government bureau at a, speculated, at a stipulated price so that the free markets will not get their way. Yes, in the short run, mm. it will bring down that tangent of inflation. But in the long run, it has a damaging effect. So we all know the economics behind it. Would you want to do business in a country that has capital control? You so don't, you don't not, want to. Right, right. Well, so you don't want to. made a very strong case for capitalism. Yes. For, well, he's a poster child. For, free market for, capitalism, for yes. Free market capitalism yes. for indexation. Yes. You know, if this goes up, okay, the other metrics should also go up. Okay. But how do you solve the problem? Where does that leave us with regard to what is it they taught us in economics in those days? Price uh, elasticity of demand. Mm. Okay, if it's a self fulfilling prophecy that the airlines can just increase uh, prices as they wish, yep. uh, fares as they wish, yep. okay, so where does that leave the social end of it? It means if we don't want to fly, we can't fly. Right. If at the moment business class is about 200 naira on some of the airlines. So what you are saying is that if it goes up to 400, oh, well, I'm good. That, yes. If you cannot pay, don't pay. They, they go by road or rail. Okay. Where, where is the rail line? That, they, where, that, where that, is, the that is government. That the government no, caused no, no, this no, issue. No, fix no, the roads no, no, and no, fix no, the I'm rail. Not, I'm not done yet. Yeah. Then with, uh, uh, you know, telecoms. Yeah. The telcos are saying... The increase in cost yes. of doing business in a harsh environment yes. has gone up by about 35%. Yes, sir. Now, they are not passing that 35% automatically. They are passing 40% of it mm. to ordinary suffering people like us. <laughs> and now to make a, a phone call, they yeah. are proposing almost about 8 naira. Correct. And then for SMS, over 6 naira yes. from about 4 naira. 40% yes. markup yep. on it. Okay, so where is the role of uh, the regulator here? I see that the, FC, uh, the NCC has moved Rejected in, it, yeah. You know, coaching his own laws. Yeah. Uh, secondly, you know, our government is saying it will negotiate with the airlines. What, what specific uh, recommendations do you have? How can this problem be solved? Because you cannot say it's a take it or leave it situation. He's just told you, take it or leave it. No, 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 it cannot be a take it or leave it situation. The, the, the telcos... I don't know. I, I talk to these folks. That's why we have the, government. The, well, that's why we have government. Otherwise, in the end, uh -huh. we will all be dead. <laughs> in the uh, but it's a failure of government. It is. You see, and uh, Dr. No, Obadiah, no, how is, should government address it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, the, the, go government, the government needs the the issue with the telcos is the diesel costs and base stations. It is incredibly expensive for them to be able to run those base stations twenty four seven. You, as the government, you need to have to provide stable electricity so that the cost margins for businesses in this country when it comes to electricity costs is up to 40% of their overheads, almost yeah. 50%. Yeah. How do you run a business you can't in a run nation a business. like that? That's what business so whose responsibility is it to provide power in order to bring those margins down so that business can be profitable? Tundu, is where government. is the silver lining? It, you are the one who is the silver lining. I must have it. You are depressing me right now because I'm I can't see the silver lining. What is it? No, okay, so when they have this meeting today, what are we expecting? They're going to come out and say, well, economy is now 200,000. Naira, 
Don't be awful, Rafael. It's a bumblebee meeting there. I'm sorry. They had a meeting in March. They had a meeting in March now. For this what did they do? So, so are you are you on the same um, page as Moman, um, what, Major Oil, Oil Marketers, Marketers of Association of Nigeria? Nigeria. Yeah. Yes, yes. Who are saying that this is some attempt to sort of arm twist the government to provide right. a subsidy for aviation fuel? What else? And doctor asked uh, that this is just what they, this day like emotional yesterday. blackmail or that we're patriots. What all that altruistic. It? I can't see it any other way. They're right. asking for a subsidy, and there's be just no money be for that. Because as of today, we already <laughs> we've not been able to tackle our FX problems. Nope. Over the years, we've not built refineries. Nope. Over the years, the investment government ought to make it has not made it. Government kept on kicking the problem down the road. Okay. Now it's coming to life. Maybe, maybe when everything collapses. No, not to say that. that <laughs> because that's the scenario you think. It will not get to Thank you for yeah. nothing. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> for Global Business Update, Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Uh, good morning. Uh, let's take a look, see how the Asia Pacific markets, first of all, beginning the week and all fairly mixed. Chinese trade data is coming uh, better than expected. However, the Nikkei is down a bit. I'll come on to Japan uh, in a moment. Um, China stocks relatively higher. The Shanghai Composite not doing too badly uh, this morning. Um, exports, as I said, doing reasonably well. Uh, the data came as uh, mainland China continues its battle uh, with COVID. Um, it's the worst outbreak since early 2022. I'll talk about a little, a little bit more about that later on. Um, here's a significant um, development in Hong Kong. Uh, John Lee is now going to be Hong Kong's um, next leader. He was the only person in the leadership election, and he was um, he, he's a Beijing loyalist. He was in charge of um, dealing with, if I can put it like that, the the the, the pro independence demonstrations that happen in the country. Um, he was he's formerly Hong Kong's chief secretary. What it actually indicates, I think, to most people in the market is that Hong Kong um, not so much will have its individuality in the future, but will be a gateway for capital into China. That's a very important move this morning, I felt. Um, meanwhile, President Xi in China um, is once again uh, at meeting of top leaders, emphasizing the importance of the zero COVID lockdown that they have there. But significantly, he did not. He did not say anything about how he's trying to support the economy, <clears throat> a lot of which is clearly being shut down because of that. That was the Politburo uh, meeting that they had beginning on Friday. Uh, Japan, for its part, is saying that uh, if it's going to phase out Russian oil, it's going to take slightly longer. Prime Minister uh, Fumi, um, Fumio uh, Kish. Uh, Kishida um, has been saying this for some time. It's going to take them a couple of years to do that, to fall in line, let me put it like this, with the rest of the G7 nations that have already taken that decision and already said that they will do it by the end of the year. As far as the United States is concerned, big drop on Wall Street. But futures, I mean, it was not so much that, it, that the week itself wasn't too bad. It was just that tremendous uh, roller coaster. At one point, if you remember from last week, the Dow Jones down over a thousand points um, on, on the day. And cumulatively, not too bad. But generally speaking, my goodness, how would you possibly be able to predict what's going on there? And of course, you add into all that stuff that we got last week about... <clears throat> interest rate rises in the United Kingdom, in the United States, whether the, the next one is going to be half a percent or three quarters of a percent and so on. Um, so that's that really. Now, most eyes in the world will be on uh, the the Kremlin and, uh, and Red Square today, May the 9th. I'm sure I don't need to remind you, is Russia's victory day. And the real question is, what is President Putin actually going to claim as a victory? It's not about uh, Ukraine. It's about the end of the Second World War. But it's been used in the past as a tremendous propaganda and PR exercise. Um, the UK has hit uh, Russia with more um, 
more sanctions, particularly on things like palladium and uh, platinum, which are used um, for, well, as you know, for electric cars and so on. Um, just actually weighing up what effect that might be having on the Russian economy. I don't think we're going to see anything like that from this victory. Of course, we are not going to see anything from that victory parade today. But the joint accumulation of UK, US, EU sanctions is meaning probably, and again, speaking to people actually in Moscow, such, such as those who actually want to talk about it to broadcast services, saying that, it, you know, gradually people are beginning to suffer. The person in the street is gradually beginning to suffer. Um, there's plenty of reserves to take care of um, the basic needs of the population, but they are not enjoying uh, luxury goods and so on. For its part, the EU is now saying this morning that they should seize uh, Russian assets, which are now frozen in a, in a bid to build Ukraine after the war, when on earth that's going to be. Um, a number of bundles of news out of the UK, cost of living crisis, um, and the number of UK households is up about a half, one in seven, who are actually um, missing on one meal, missing a meal because of what's going on. And one of the energy bosses has said that people will be in fuel poverty um, if there is no help from the government. The government, as far as heating is concerned and energy is concerned, the government is saying this morning that it will probably uh, reset their view about that later in the year. Um, the McColl's uh, convenience stores, we talked about that on Friday, didn't we? Uh, Morrison's and the petrol forecourt people, e.g., are bidding now to try to take it over. Um, and the Prime Minister Boris Johnson will use tomorrow's Queen's speech. It's called the Queen's speech. She won't be giving it probably, again, and there's a bit of a debate about that because of her failing health, but it's normally used to outline <clears throat> from being spoken by a member of the royal family uh, as, as to what um, the, the proposals, the kind of legislature for the government is going to be over the next 12 months. And what Johnson's trying to do is clearly reboot the government's performance in that and so on. Um, I'll draw your attention to diesel as far as commodities are concerned, which is rapidly increasing in price. Price is surging on that. Very, very important for um, industry. And finally, um, oil and gold both trading sideways. Gold slightly beat Bitcoin in terms of a, um, of a of a recession play, but not a lot. That's the global view this morning. All right, Michael, can we say this is the 1970s all over again? Because it was just after the Yom Kippur War and the embargo on America, inflation started to shoot up. Now the UK projected 10%. UK is fast becoming a poverty capital of some sort, cost of living, whatever you like it. Those data you are churning out as regards cost of living, I tell you for free, is worse than that. More families can't even do a meal a day any longer in the UK. And this is supposed to be the bastion of Western civility, the United Kingdom. That's one. Number two, uh, when will this sanction kick in in Russia? I keep asking because a lot of people are beginning to say that this war is getting out too long. Too long in every respect. Too long as regards the oil market. Too long as regards the inflation it's generating. And too long as regards the consumer products that Russia and Ukraine have to churn out that they cannot churn out because of the war that is causing cascading problems all over Africa and even Europe. I'm talking about sunflower oil, wheat, and the likes. Well, I, uh, I know no, no more than anybody else does about how long the war with Russia um, is, is going to take the war that Russia has with Ukraine. Um, if it does what it's what it's say, well, we're going to hear a lot more from during the victory parade, obviously, about this. When Putin gives his speech, um, will, will he continue to try to annex other parts of Ukraine? Really don't know. Yes, of course, it's causing problems. There's no, no question about that. And it's causing supply chain problems because we are, as we've often said, no man is an island in the world at the moment. I think the bigger question is, is this going to be the end of globalization? I suspect that perhaps it might be. It might be that the world is fragmenting into different kind of blocks in terms of what, what it actually expects. But I, I do, however, think that, uh, that, that we have we have been used to a just in time, cheapest kind of goods um, existence and of course that's changing now and somebody was coming on the radio the other day saying that you know talking about cheap energy energy isn't cheap why should energy be cheap it, it, it just isn't 
it isn't cheap because it has to be created and it's and, and, and the benefit from somebody is a cost to somebody else that's unfortunately how the world works so that so this word cheap is something that maybe we should get used to not being able to use for much further as far as the UK is concerned, I'm not quite sure where you're getting your um, that, that that families can't afford to put one meal on the table from. But if you've got that information, uh, that's fine. No, it's not like the 70s. The 70s was inflation at 17 and a half percent. Mortgages, as I've, as I've said to you before, of 25 percent. I lived through that. That was when I that was when we were buying our first properties, um, uh, property or somewhere to live, our first flats, our first accommodation um, in London or where, where we happen to be based. So it's not like the 1970s um, and, and th th there is not the, the total dependence upon OPEC and upon Saudi and the other Gulf states for oil. It's coming from elsewhere. So I think the world is slightly more variegated than that. I'm not saying there's not a cost of living crisis. Of course, there is. I don't think it's quite as severe as that. I think that the, most politicians are using you know, statistics to try to support their case. But certainly energy is going to be important. And I think that the government will have to offer some kind of help. Not quite convinced about a windfall tax, but of course, there have been more calls on that, uh, about that over the weekend, as far as BP and Shell are concerned. OK, let's start with Britain. I mean, the report uh, on that reference, I guess, is the Food Foundation report, uh, which says one out of seven adults in the UK at this moment is facing the crisis of food insecurity. And there are many households now are collecting uh, cold food, uh, you know, and they cannot uh, uh, afford energy costs to have uh, warm uh, meals, and some are skipping meals. When I saw that report, I was like, you know, in Britain, in good old Britain, is this so serious? And I had it in mind that I will ask you, because you are out there, we're just reading uh, uh, reports. Is it really that bad? And a lady called Anna Taylor says that what you know, uh, Britain is facing at the moment, it's not just an economic crisis, it's also a health crisis that is linked uh, to the cost of living crisis. That is one. The second thing, the uh, Dubai uh, Department of uh, International Investment just issued a report saying that the United Arab Emirates uh, is uh, the number one global destination for greenfield uh, foreign direct investments. Okay, the uh, Crown Prince says, this is because the ruler of Dubai and the prime minister, the vice president, uh, because of his leadership and vision. Uh, but down the line in the report, we're told that, uh, you know, it's because in terms of the indicators, Dubai has become the third global destination uh, for, for uh, investments. Uh, is there something they're doing right in Dubai uh, that other countries uh, need to learn about? Finally, the digital markets unit now being proposed uh, in the uh, in Britain, uh, Australian type, you know, to uh, check the uh, big techs to promote competition and innovation. You know the details. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that digital uh, markets unit would have the teeth to bite to make a difference? And would they? Would, are we going to have the same kind of situation Australia had with uh, Google uh, when they tried the same thing last year? Uh, as far as the DMU is concerned, I would, I, 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 I'll wait to see what happens. If, if civil th ser servants think that they can actually um, get a, get ahead of the way technical companies and the way that people actually want to use for better or worse, um, and and Generation Z, as now we have to call it, is actually complete, regarding people that use WhatsApp as being old fashioned and fuddy duddies. They are moving ahead of all this. This, I don't think the DMU. I, I don't. I don't think that civil servants are actually across this. I don't think many of them actually use those kind of services, even if they're back in their offices after the pandemic. So I don't have a great deal of, uh, of thought about the DMU. I was in Dubai at the conference, I don't know whether you were there, Doctor, about um, 15 years ago, when Dubai was actually starting, was actually saying there will be an international financial centre built in Dubai, ready for the WEF that was coming up the following year. And my goodness, they built it. I sat in somebody's office on the on the 40th or 50th floor, looked down at a, at a hole in the ground that there was a that there was the size of an English county, and he said that's where the financial market is going to be. Dubai has for many years pushed itself as as trying to diversify away from oil, and, and it's it's looking very very hard at financial products. Also, 
But you happen to look at where airlines actually, where the main hubs are, and they tend to be in the UAE right now. Now, that to me is a forward indicator of a place that one will act as a free port, two has got the climate to do it, three may finally, finally do something about solar and make itself independent, and certainly as a financial centre, provided, provided it gets the confidence of London, New York, and maybe, and may, and maybe even. Hong Kong stroke China, um, it, it might push itself ahead. You can't just build a financial centre. You've got to build trust, and you've got to build, you've got to build corporate, um, corporate proof that it actually works. What? Dubai actually did at the time was to hire a load of people who got City of London experience, some of whom I met over there, and, and they, they did a good job. So that's what's driving that. If that works, then that'll that'll work that'll work quite well. As far as England and poverty and the foundation and reports like that are concerned, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm certain that's true. But what are these levels of poverty? This is the question that I don't understand. What does poverty actually mean? As I've said before, I'm not excusing what's going on, of course, but it, it wasn't like that when I was in London on Friday and on Thursday, and it certainly wasn't like that when I was down at the supermarket down here uh, on Saturday. Yes, there were some empty shelves, but there are empty shelves in lots of places simply because of supply chain problems. Now, are there health problems as a result of people not eating? Go to the supermarket and see what people are actually buying. I, I couldn't possibly comment. I don't know. If, if I were on the PR side or the press side of these charities, I'd be pushing the same kind of story. I'm not exactly sure how true it is. Well, earlier on, oh, are you done, Dr. Abati? Yeah, yeah. Earlier on, Rufai was um, referring to capital controls that we saw in 1980s Nigeria. So he reminded me, I've been meaning to ask you, what exactly is behind the apparent recovery of the ruble? What do you think of that? And really, is it being, well, artificially propped up? Yeah, I think I think it is. I think I think that the central bank she she has played an absolute blinder, and I do know that she was threatening to resign as a result of the the sanctions. And Putin persuaded I don't know how he did it, but he persuaded her to stay in office. And I think she's actually played played a complete blind. You see, they're still selling. Are still selling their major products, which are gas and oil, to countries like China and India. So the sanctions themselves, I don't think, particularly as far as Europe's concerned, are going to have a great deal of effect. That, that's, that, that's, I understand it, is what's, what's keeping the ruble up. But as I say, you don't know what the truth is in Russia, no more than you know what it is in China. I can only go what the market's saying. But for me, this woman... I, her name has just escaped me for the moment, but she she is the central bank governor. She's not very old. She's probably in her mid thirties, and she's played an absolute blinder. No question about that. And she was voted actually Forbes central bank um, central banker um, of 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 the year um, only two or three years ago. So she knows what she's doing. I I, 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 I don't, honestly don't know what the truth is. I suspect. I suspect. That when the sanctions actually start to hit hard, I'm not talking about oil and gas. I'm talking about the more targeted ones, and particularly the sanctions on. We've seen men, members of uh, the, the, the Gazprom, haven't we, um, with sanctions put upon them um, today? I think there's when, when those start to bite at that end. But when when society starts to worry about the war, where it's going, why they're doing it. Why, why there are empty supermarket shelves. I mean, we know that the Russians have a long history of being able to, to stick with things, the kind of, I mean, how they stuck with Stalin and the, those purges, God alone knows, but they did. So they have, they have a lot of resilience, but what the truth is, I don't know. But yes, the ruble, as you quite rightly observe, is doing much better than it did, um, than it did before, the, before the invasion. Thank you, Mr. Wilson.